You're listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Lent. We're full swing into Lent. Mm-hmm. And we have yet to cover Lenten hymns. I know. What What are we thinking? How did we miss this? There are so many. So it is time. <laughs> I think what it was is we thought at the beginning of Lent, like Ash Wednesday, we didn't want to burden all the cantors with, yeah. with uh, great questions, <laughs> our burning questions about Lenten hymns. Um, so we're doing it in the middle of Lent. Like, there's a little... It's, it's calmed down a little bit, right? Maybe. So in... in <laughs> Today, opportunity to talk with uh, one of our favorite cantors, Matt Mackamer. He's associate cantor at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne and always willing to take our crazy questions about <laughs> hymnody. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being our guest today. Oh, it's great to be with you. How are things at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, when it comes to, uh, from the the cantor's perspective? Oh, well, you know, I, I think things are wonderful. Like you had said, we're kind of full on into Lent now. So um, there's just a lot of things to do at this time of the year for church musicians and cantors. Um, there's a lot of things to do at this time of the year for pastors. Um, but it's also the best time of the year to be involved in church work. Oh, it's just wonderful. There's so much to say, so much to play, um, and it's all good. So, you know, I can't complain. It's I'm living the dream. And we, we get this every year during Lent, but it never gets old. Yeah, it does come every year. I notice that, too. <laughs> and you're right. It's great. It's always, you know, you're always kind of picking up new things or, or realizing little things that you've never noticed before. You know, the Lord just keeps leading you a little deeper in every year. And it's just just a great thing. Absolutely. That was a great segue, too. Uh, so <laughs> we're talking about hymns, <laughs> and we have a list, well... The three of us have a list in front of us. Um, and the first hymn that you picked is uh, maybe not a familiar one to a lot of people, but it's so it's so good. Um, Lutheran Service Book 432, In Silent Pain, the Eternal Son. Tell us a little bit about this hymn. Sure. Well, this hymn has really kind of grown on me over the years. And like you said, I, I don't know how familiar it is to some folks, um, but it's it's really worth the time. Um it's a it's a more contemporary hymn in the sense of it's been written, the tune and the text have been written probably within the last, oh, oh gosh, well, 92 for the text and yeah. 1988 for the tune. So, yeah, you know, within a generation or two. Um, but the text was written by Christopher Idle. He's a, a priest in the Church of England and a pretty prolific British hymn writer. Um, the tune was written by a gentleman named John Bell, who um, is part of the Iona community in Ireland. It's kind of a uh, a liturgical, ecumenical community centered on, like, uh, life and prayer and discipleship and stuff like that. Um, but a kind of an interesting, an interesting group of folks who are really focused on kind of a, a renewal of congregational worship, you know, uh, things for the people to sing and not just the choir or the instruments to play. Um, so it, it, it's... It comes out of that tradition, but it's it's a really striking text. It's a nice tune, um, and I think it's probably deserving of everybody's attention. Uh, it, it can add a lot to this season, I think. Looking at this, uh, in I, I'm looking at it in Lutheran Service Book, and noticing that only the melody is printed there. Is there some advantage to everyone singing just the melody, singing in unison, especially during yeah. the season of Lent? Why are you, I, I Sarah's think, laughing at me. No, I, I think so. And I think, you know, and I know that there's, I can think of a few seminarians right now who would be uh, just, you know, looking away from me in disgust because they love to sing parts so much. But I think there are times where that can be benefic- beneficial. And some of those things are practical. Some of those reasons are practical. Some of them are maybe more um, theological. Mm-hmm. But on a practical sense, if this is not, a hymn that your congregation is really familiar with. If you're looking at the hymnal and all you see is the melody, that can be kind of helpful to you as you make your way through that tune, because you're only focusing on one musical line at a time, and you're not seeing everything else that the organist is seeing when he's playing. And that can help you kind of hone in. Um, I think also having it just in unison can be really nice because it does present this kind of strong unified sound from the congregation. Um, 
And, you know, the more a congregation sings out with vigor, you know, the more every individual kind of loses their own voice in the collective voice of the congregation. And that's just wonderful. It's just great. Um, So this hymn, I think, does that pretty well. The way the tune is put together is also pretty easy to learn. The first two lines are very similar to each other, as is the fourth line. Um, The middle, the third line of music is really kind of the B section. But you're always running into things that you've heard before. It kind of has this folk type sound mm-hmm. um, that we've gotten used to with other hymns, um, say from like the Southern Harmony or, or shape note type of things. It's mm-hmm. got this kind of folk sound to it, which makes it pretty easy to pick up. Um, but the text also is just wonderful. I mean, it hits you right over the head from line number one. In silent pain, the eternal sun hangs derelict and still. I mean, it's just so stark and beautiful. Um, And if you'll permit me, uh, can I read stanza three to you? Sure. Yeah, this is, I think, my favorite one. It it kind of puts the cross and the passion of Jesus in the context of, like, all of human history. And this is the thing that all of history turns on to. Um, For strife he came to bring a sword, the truth to end all lies, to rule in us our patient Lord until all evil dies. For in his hand he holds the stars, his voice shall speak to end our wars, and those who love him see his scars and look into his eyes. So even at the end of time, we still see the um, the proof of Christ's crucifixion in his scars, and we look right at him knowing that we're redeemed by that very death that he's died for us. It's just great. Yeah, the... the- the poetry and the text in this hymn, it's very striking. Like you almost have to, you have to read it slowly and then sing it (laughs) because because you almost have to strong coffee. Yeah. yeah, Right. You have to, I mean, it takes a little bit of, of, of thought to, to realize what's happening. And you mentioned it's a folky tune and those folky tunes are some of my favorites in the hymnal. I'm a big fan of the folky tunes. Yeah. And they, you know, they can be done really well and they're, they're uh, kind of intuitive to Mm -hmm. learn. So that, that, I think, is another kind of plus in the column for this one, especially if your congregation doesn't know it. It's a tune that'll stick with you, and it's not difficult to learn. Absolutely. Before we run out of time, uh, well, let's move on to uh, yes, the, next, yes. the next one in our list, uh, Lutheran Service Book 438, <laughs> A Lamb Goes On Complaining Forth. Now, this one is probably familiar to a lot of yeah. people and maybe yeah, a, least, one of those favorites. Yeah, at least to some, I would say. Yeah, tell and, us about this one. Well, it's penned by maybe the greatest Lutheran hymn writer of all time, Mm -hmm. um, and that's Paul Gerhardt. Um, All of his hymns are characterized by this kind of excellent poetry and beautiful text, but also this really strong, faithful confession of these timeless kind of doctrinal, objective truths. Um, Luther did that a lot in in his hymns also, but I think Gerhardt does it in a way that's just so poetic and beautiful. It's really kind of unsurpassed, um, his texts. Um, His life was pretty tough. He was a pastor during the Thirty Years' War. He was unsettled and unmarried until he was 44 years old, and then after he got married, his wife died four years later. Um, Except for a really brief stint in his career, he wasn't really well received by a lot of his parishioners as he held different placements in Germany as a pastor. Um, But the hymns that come out of this man's mind are just really amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, He's got three hymns just in the Lenten hymn section of LSB. This one, um, he was the translator and and did a little bit of work with the text for our O Sacred Head Now Wounded, and then also wrote the text for Upon the Cross Extended, which is hymn 453, Mm -hmm. but wrote literally hundreds of texts. I want to say like 450 plus hymn texts. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Wow. Just amazing output. And they're all excellent. Yeah. What about the tune for uh, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth? Yeah, the tune was written by a man, Wolfgang Dauchstein. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> he was a monk in Stroudsburg. He was an organist at the cathedral there and lived during the time of the Reformation and was kind of swept up in this Lutheran Reformation and ended up kind of signing on to everything that was happening. So he became a preacher and an organist at St. Thomas Church there in Stroudsburg, 
um, was a nice combination of a theologian and a musician. Um, so he was the one who wrote the melody for this tune. Now, Gerhardt lived after the time of the Reformation in the 17th century. So this tune is around before then. Um, and perhaps Gerhardt had this tune in mind as he was composing his text. I'm not sure. But you've got two... Uh, Two churchmen who come out of Germany and are living that kind of Lutheran Reformed lifestyle at different points on the timeline. We only have a couple minutes left, and I want to get to the third one on the list for today, because this takes us into Holy Week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Shall we move forward to uh, the Royal Banners Forward Go? Yes, absolutely. Um, This is another one that may not be very familiar um, to everybody. It's a very old text. Uh, the gentleman who wrote it, Fortunatus, lived in the 6th century. Um, he was a bishop in Poitiers at the end of the 6th century into the 7th. Um, and just this, this beautiful text, it was actually written, um, let's see, gosh, I want to say probably in the mid-6th century. Um, but it was sung in a procession uh when relics of what they believed to be the true cross was found by Emperor Justin II and transported to the monastery in Poitiers. Um, the cross, as you, as some of you, your listeners might know, was kind of at least the legend has it that Constantine's mother found the true cross. And then later on in the 6th century, portions of this, this instrument were transported uh, to the monastery where Fortunatus was. So this hymn was originally sung as part of that procession. And one of the interesting things about the hymn is I almost look at it in a sacramental type of lens. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that like a relic or something like that, like the cross can do anything for us by the, by means of giving us grace. But this realization that God has used these really earthly elements to accomplish our salvation, um, And part of that was that God himself was nailed to this piece of wood at a moment and period and died for us. And this hymn does a great, a great job of focusing the singer's attention on what that means for us and the beauty that we see in this really cruel instrument of Roman torture, because it was the means by which our salvation was accomplished. It's just you know, a beautiful, beautiful text. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, too, that uh, the tune, uh, you kind of almost think that the tune and the text go together originally, but the tune is written, what, in the 2000s? Which is really fascinating. The tune is, it's it's really, a it's kind of a musical paraphrase of a much older plain chant, a much older chant melody that was, um, it was a sarum plain chant that was found in kind of the Latin cycle of the music for the liturgy. But um, as a lot of chant is, it was much lengthier and there were lots of, uh, you know, kind of melismas and all these exciting things that were happening. So uh, Paul Weber, the, the person who's credited with this tune, took elements of that chant and basically metricized it and made it into a very kind of regular hymn tune type of style so that it could get a broader appeal. So if you listen to the old chant, you'll hear a lot of elements that are very similar to this tune. Mm -hmm. But the tune takes those elements and makes them metrical and gives it a regular beat and rhythm so that it's a lot easier to sing as a congregation. I'm more of a traditionalist. You can't metricize any <laughs> hymns. We've got to stick to the original. Uh, hey, you know, <laughs> we are all out of time. For that too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Our guest today, Matt Mockover, Associate Cantor at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thank you so much, Matt, for being our guest today. Thank you both. Have a blessed Lent. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs>
The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Thank you.